So let's dive right in. Our very first reference points are passages that not only uh, serve as the foundation for this adventure that I want to begin here this morning, because it's always an adventure, uh, but they're not only f- for that purpose, but, but they also serve as an underlying, uh, an underpinning principle for any journey, any journey into the precious Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and 2 Timothy 2, 15. Every scripture is God-breathed given by his inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will and thought, purpose, and action, so that the man or woman of God may be complete and proficient, well-fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then you go to the 215 there. Study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightfully handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. Amen to the word of God. Uh, a lot of us don't know, or maybe we just haven't perceived yet, that this, these two scriptures apply to us, especially the second one, because we don't think of ourselves as being necessarily teachers, right? But, but we are, because uh, if nothing else, you, have you seen those little creatures that follow you around sometimes? <laughs> those little human creatures, you're teaching them every second of every moment of every day. So we're all teachers, whether we realize it or not. So let's begin building a foundation here this morning with a question that I hope leads us into a a general understanding of our past so that we can gain a complete comprehension and perspective of of our immediate and long-term future. And that is this, this question. How much do we value the fact that we have a Bible that we can pick up and read for ourselves how much do we value that it's almost like asking how much do you value the american flag you know uh it's that type of uh entity how much do we value the fact or do we just take it for granted and i remember little and seeing that huge bible on my my granny's table and there was so much dust on that thing you could have written the ten commandments on it you know (laughs) It didn't seem to be valued too much. How much do we value that? We actually have a Bible that, think about this. How would we like it if in order to read the Bible, we had to learn Greek or German or Latin first? Just to read the Bible. You know, we had to learn a different language than what we already speak. Consider the fact then that the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, was written sometime, sometime in between the years of 69 to 96 A.D., about, about somewhere in that period of time. It was not until the year 1382, which I know seems like a long time ago, uh, the way things are progressing. It wasn't that long ago, Bob will tell you. So, <laughs> by his own admission... Remember, he was there when the dulcimer was, was invented. He said that. So. <laughs> so, 1382. It wasn't until 1382 that there was a completed English translation of the New Testament. 1,382 years after Jesus rose from the dead did we get an English version of the New Testament and it wasn't until two years later before the entire Old Testament was translated into English so so if you look at that then it wasn't until approximately 1300 years after Revelation was written that our Bibles could be read by by a person who only knew the English language that's pretty phenomenal if you think about it that's a lot to take in when, when we talk about this book that some of us just leave setting sometimes as a paperweight. 
Both testaments were translated into English from Latin for the first time by a man named John Wycliffe. Well, he wasn't by himself. He had associates of people who helped him. But it was translated for the first time uh, and by John Wycliffe and another man, which you've probably seen his name on things, William Tyndale, you see, T-Y-N, you've probably seen his name on stuff. Well, here's a guy. He was the first to translate the entire Bible into English from Greek and Hebrew. First guy to ever do this. Pretty amazing. But there was some amazing response to this, some amazing reaction to this too, and not in a positive way. I mean, you, we might think today that, that the church leaders way back when would appreciate and they would have been glad to have a translation that the common people could read, that everybody could join in and start participating in and it could understand for themselves. But that was not the case at all. Not at all. I mean, during John Wycliffe's life, he, he was hunted and he was despised by the church for his work and for his teaching, which resulted from him being able to read the Bible now from his own personal study. And he did die a natural death, but they were so mad at this guy. Years after his death, they went in and dug up his body and pulled his bones out of the ground, burned them, and threw them into the river. That's how much they hated this guy for what he did. That, that, that's, that's some of the history of, of this we take for granted. Now, I'm not uh, here to condemn anybody. I'm just here to kind of wake us up, you know, and remind us how important this really is. Uh, Tyndale didn't fare quite as well. He didn't. Man, this guy, I'll tell you what, he was arrested. He was put in prison for his crime of translating the Bible into English. It was a crime. And so he was arrested. He was in prison for about a year, tried and convicted of the crime of giving the Bible to the common people. If you can imagine, that was on the books as a crime. He broke the law. His sentence was that he be strangled to death, and then after he was dead, to be burned at the stake. For what? For translating the Bible into English. Wow, I mean, as I think about that, it almost, I'll go back to the 60s here, almost blows my mind. This is one reason why the question comes up then, if you understand a little bit about history, how much do I value the fact that I have a Bible that I can pick up and read for myself? How much do I value that? The church leaders back then stated that the reason they were so afraid of common people having the Bible is because, uh, and in, in their own language, whatever that language may be, they didn't think that the common person could understand the Bible for themselves. And they were afraid that if everyone started reading the Bible, they would interpret it incorrectly and all kinds of weird teachings would result. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The irony of that, and it's almost humorous, though, to a certain extent, they were right, but the irony of the word they wanted to keep under wraps told them that this was going to happen. It was prophesied in the book anyway, so it kind of makes it humorous, you know. Uh, that's another study for another time, but just so you know what I'm referring to, consider this. People who handle God's word incorrectly will come up and do come up with all kinds of strange ideas and may even lead people astray. And it happens, it's happening right now as I'm talking. It's happening right now. People teach their own ideas, their own interpretations, uh, their own self-motivated uh, principles from the very word of God. Someone is using the Bible right now to teach a strange idea that's really not even from the Bible. But the real, and, and God said that was going to happen. So that's, that's part of this experience. That's a risk that we have to take, right? But the real reason, the underlying reason that the church authorities way back when didn't want us commoners to have the scripture in our hands is because they feared the loss of power, Power is what it was all about. Now, publicly, they'd say, well, we just know you can't understand it. But privately, they didn't want to lose any power. What would happen if I were to take all your Bibles away from you? Everybody's Bible uh, is gone. You don't have access to it, even on the Internet. It's all gone and from the church buildings, from your home, from your car, from your computer, everywhere that you might have access to a Bible. There isn't one. The only Bible that's left then is in this fellowship 
or, or any other fellowship. The only Bible that's left is the one the minister reads from. The priest, the pastor, the bishop, whatever, the clergy, whatever you want to call us. That's the only Bible. Imagine that now today. That's all there is. The, 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 the one and only Bible the pastor has, and to top it off, it's not even in English. It's in Latin or German. The picture of that, what happens then? Well, I'll tell you what happens. I suddenly become very, very powerful. I become the man, so to speak. You know, if I was different gender, I'd become the woman, no matter what people say. It's either or. Biologically, it's either or. You can say what you want. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> I'm identifying as a filthy rich person right now. <laughs> Okay, anyway, I just had vacation, folks, so I'm kind of, you kind of renewed here. So, but imagine, I would have, I suddenly become very powerful. You would have no way of checking up on me to discover that what I'm speaking from the podium or the pulpit is the truth. You'd have no way of checking up on me. You'd have to believe, well, he must be telling me the truth. He's the pastor. He's the only one with the Bible, and who can read it? You, it must be. And when I say that the Bible records that something is true, you'd have no choice but to accept it if you want to live the way that I say is obedience to Jesus the Christ. Does that make sense to you? Just imagine that. If you do not have a Bible and you cannot read it, even if you did sneak up to the a church and take a look at it, you have no way of knowing the truth. You really don't. No way of knowing the truth. You become a puppet with strings pulled by other human beings. And, and believe it or not, society lived that way for a long time. For a long time. Humans who hold the strings that control you because he or she knows what the scriptures teach and you do not. Those men who worked to give us the English translation of the Bible knew the importance of us having that for ourselves. They knew the importance of individuals being able to read, being able to understand, and being able to apply this Word of God to their everyday lives. They knew the importance of it. In fact, they knew it was so important that they put their lives in danger and even sacrificed their lives in order that we might have this Bible to read in 2016. If we allow this word of God to sit on the shelf or sit in the car or wherever we allow it to sit and allow it to gather dust, we have not only mocked the memory of these men who sacrificed so much so that we could have this word in English, we also dishonor the Christ that it speaks about. That's how important this is. And I know I'm, I'm just reminding most of you, I realize that, but some of you have not grabbed a hold of this yet. You've not really understood how important this really, well, it's a Bible. No, no. People died. God himself died to give us the right and the privilege to have this right now. God did. By entering this place together when we do and participating in the experience of hearing his word, we can demonstrate how, demonstrate how much we value the fact that we have a Bible that we can pick up and read for ourselves. For ourselves. Charles Spurgeon said this, a Bible which is falling apart usually belongs to a person who isn't. Yeah. <laughs> what a great line. Hearing God's word together gives us a lot of information. And it's amazing if you think about it. We get a lot of information from this book. History, science, uh, theology, uh, philosophy, and uh, personality studies, uh, psychology. It's all in there. It, and many, many other topics. It's all in there. But the reason God gave us this Bible, this word of God, is not simply to get smarter, to increase our intellect. He wants the information to transform us, to change us, to make us different each and every day and each and every time we read it. Some of you are experiencing that for the very first time. You read a scripture, we talk about this, but you read a scripture last week and you read it again this week. It means totally something different to you now. 
It's amazing. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We have at our disposable an entire library of books that most of us can hold in one hand. So some of us get the extra large print like I got yesterday for a friend of mine. And it, you have to need two hands to hold it because it, it's, it, you know, it's size 17 font. But most of us can hold in one hand what we call uh, this book. But this is actually an entire library. This is, a, not, this is not just a book. This, this is 66 books. This is a library we're carrying around here 66 books the word of God is a wonderfully divine collection of different types of literature that are so alive that they can make their appeals through many different avenues and it's amazing when you read the entire thing but all the while it appeals through these avenues all the while the vast and numerous approaches within these pages always lead us to the same person Jesus the Christ yeah. Always, always, always. This is exactly why we should study and, and be eager to do our utmost, as Scripture says, to present ourselves to God. We have a tendency to want to present ourselves to each other when we study and, you know, and, and, and do it that way. But Scripture reads we present ourselves to to God, because if you can look God in the face with what you're studying and what you quote and, and how you absorb this, you can look anybody else in the face. It's a non-issue. Because, and, and I know that Pastor Josh, Pastor Brian, and I, we, we have to look God in the face before we speak to you. But I'm telling you, if you will look God in the face with what you believe and what you've read and what you study, you can look anybody in the face. It won't be an issue. This is exactly why we should study and be eager to do our utmost to present ourselves, to do our utmost, approved, tested by trial, it says, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing, accurately dividing, rightfully handling this word, and skillfully teaching Jesus Christ, who is the word of truth. That's who Jesus is, the word of truth. And you got to know in this age where entertainment and cotton candy, sugar coating, uh, you know, that's, that's some of the most popular approaches to preaching now. Is, is you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. Yeah. You know, uh, this, this sugar coated entertaining, well, if I can make you, and we laugh together, but sometimes you see where the only purpose is to make you laugh. The only purpose is to entertain you. That's not what this is for. We cannot forget it is our scriptural obligation to teach the word. If you don't read the word, you don't know that. It's our obligation to teach the word of truth. John 8, 32, Jesus said this, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. To know in this scripture is actually the word ginosko, G-I-N, ginosko, and it literally means to experientially know and obey the truth. It's through experience. Jesus says we will know the truth by experience, and that's what will set us free. Not knowing, just knowing. You know, a lot of us just know. I know some people who, who can uh, quote this uh, frontwards and backwards, but they don't know the truth. You experientially know. A lot of us search for only pure knowledge or the acquisition of facts. And Jesus wants, to, wants us to allow him to help us reach out beyond this intellectual pursuit into a breadth, into a length, as it states in Scripture, a height and a depth. Ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. All the way to Jesus and his wonderful attributes like never before. Listen to the Lord as he speaks through Jeremiah, the prophet, uh, chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise and skillful person... I don't know, are these scriptures on the PowerPoint? 
They're, they're not on there. Hmm. Strange. We're going to have to talk with somebody. Uh, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise and skillful person glory and boast in his wisdom and skill. Let not the mighty and powerful person glory and boast in his strength and power. Let not the person who is rich in physical gratification and earthly wealth glory and boast in his temporal satisfactions and earthly riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands stands and knows me. That's God talking. Knows me personally and practically directly discerning and recognizing God's character that I am the Lord who practices loving kindness judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these things I delight says the Lord. You must for yourself in your own heart. Not, son, not your pastors, not your neighbor, not your elder, not your Sunday school teacher. You must in your own heart, in your own mind, in your own soul, in your own body, right down to the marrow of every bone in your body, you must experience the word of truth, which is Jesus Christ himself. And this is the way to do that. This is the avenue in conjunction, and we'll, which we'll talk about briefly, but, but this is the way to do it. You must experience unshakably that he is God's word, even though the whole world around us tells us it ain't so. And that's what's happening. You'd have to be kind of blind not to see that or deaf not to hear that. The whole world around us is trying to tell us that's not so. If you do not have this confident resolve, this firm foundation, if you do not, as we used to say, know that you know that you know, then maybe you haven't yet fully experienced and fully tasted of God's word. Luke 21, 33, the sky and the earth, that means the universe and the world, will pass away, but my words will not pass away. No matter what an apocalypse may or may not be, everything, even the roaches are going to be dead, but this will not die. This will not pass away. I didn't mean anything by that. <laughs> Although that's, that's a good metaphor because they survived a tornado, you know, but uh, I meant the bugs. <laughs> Isaiah 48, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God will stand forever. 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, for all flesh, all mankind is like grass and all its glory, all its honor like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower drops off, but the word of the Lord, divine instruction, the gospel endures forever. And this word is the good news which was preached to you. Man, oh man. So let's close up. Let's start closing up to talk briefly about the, uh, being effective students and effective teachers of God's word of truth. The first two things I just want to cover real briefly. First, we must commit to investigation. We personally, personally commit the act of carrying out some type of personal, systematic, or formal inquiry into his word in order to discover and claim the truth for ourselves. Not from mommy, not from daddy, for ourselves. I say, I know I say that a lot, at least I think I do. My perception may be way off, but I think I do. Beyond Sunday morning, beyond weekly home group, beyond personally, individually, privately, day by day, even habitually. For ourselves, our ancestors have given their very own lives so that we could have this privilege. And as I stated, God came in the flesh and gave his very own life so that we could have this honor. Consuming God's word goes beyond merely being a mandated spiritual discipline. This is the, the ultimate vitamin. This is the ultimate. The, we're so over-medicated in America. We want everything to fix a symptom and we forget about the causes. This goes to the cause. This is a time-released capsule. And if you take it, it will be time-released throughout your entire life. But you got to take it. You got to take it. Did you know that you can't really understand a part of this Bible without 
comprehending another part of it. You interpret the Bible by reading the Bible. That, that's how it works. Because you can read a certain scripture and think, well, I don't understand that. But then you go back to Isaiah and you go back to Psalm and you say, oh, oh, aha. And I know, well, Pastor Jerry, I don't understand the Bible. I can't read King James. Get a different version. Ooh, some people aren't going to like that. We know those people, don't we, Bob? <laughs> some people aren't. But I'm telling you, get a different version. There are some excellent English versions of the Bible that are accurate that will help you understand. And plus, plus, when you do your own investigation, it keeps you alive. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Our very own experiences verify the truth for us. When you stop reading the word, those of you who are believers and disciples, when you stop reading the word, what happens? You just get all mean and nasty and depressed and, and you start, you know, complaining about things and talking about people and blah, 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 blah. You know it's true. It's, isn't it true? Say amen. Somebody say amen. amen. It's true. When you stop reading the word, you change. It's the same as a person who stops eating. Their mental attitude, their heart, their emotion, everything starts changing because they're miserable. And their body starts consuming itself. What do you think happens to us? We don't consume ourselves when we stop reading the word. We start consuming everybody else. When you stop reading the word, bad things happen and life just gets drained right out of you. And here comes the negativity, the complaining, all of it, depression. This is why Jesus said what he said in Luke 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we have to commit to personal investigation. Again, repeating what I've said a million times in the last 17 years, read it for yourself. Look it up for yourself. Check me out. Check anybody out who speaks the word of God to you and make sure they're telling you the word of truth. Make sure for yourself. That's so important, especially on Judgment Day. You're not going to be able to blame the pastor then. Of course, pastor's going to get in enough trouble. You know, he's got a different accountability anyway. But God's going to say, well, did you look it up for yourself? Well, no, no. Did you have a Bible that was translated into English for you by people who gave their life so that that could happen? Yeah. Did you read it? No. It's sat in the other room. I never did really. Read it. Re live it. Abide in it. Absorb it. I'm telling you, one scripture a day will change your life. Just want it down. I'm not talking about, you know, being a theologian, although you become one without even intending to. One scripture a day will change your life. If we fail to ingest this word of God, we fall short in our overall understanding of who God really is, and that means we'll fall short in living this life. If you're not reading and studying the word of God on your own, then you are overlooking it. And don't let that happen to you. Don't get caught because one day turns into two, two turns into three, three turns into a week. And the next thing you know, a month has gone by. You haven't even looked at the Bible at home. Investigate for yourself. And then the second thing is learn to spend time asking the Holy Spirit to teach you. That's why we have him. I know we think we have him for a whole lot of other reasons. But Jesus said, you will get the spirit of truth, and he's going to teach you and guide you into all things. The Holy Spirit that you have allows you to understand this book, whereas a person who does not have the Holy Spirit, who is not born again, has a, a very strong possibility that they're not going to understand anything in this book. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural non-spiritual person does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God, for they are folly, they are meaningless nonsense to him, and he is incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing and understanding them, estimating and appreciating them. So the Holy Spirit is in you to help you understand the Word of God and practically and tangibly apply it to Toyota Monday through Friday. 
you know, apply wherever you work or whatever you, whatever you, you know, do. The fire and rain, you know, just uh, the Holy Spirit is. And that's the beautiful thing about this whole family of God. We're all in the same boat. We have different gifts. That's what I'm doing now. But we're all in the same boat. We are reliant upon God. We depend on the Holy Spirit together. Together. And he'll help you understand this word. Commit to investigate. In other words, commit to reading. And ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. Then let him. Allow him to teach you. Do not read this word for the only purposes of finding what you already believe. Don't do that. Read it to believe what you discover. If you'll do that, if you'll do that, the Holy Spirit will change you to a degree. I don't even know if we can even imagine what God will do. And there, there's so many other things to talk about, but I'm going to go right ahead and, and ask you again, one, just with everything that we've spoken here thus far, how much do you value that you have a Bible that you can open and read for yourself? Let your actions answer that question. In the name of Jesus, let your actions be your answer. I'm going to close with this. If you were to find 10 people from our local area having different backgrounds and uh, speak the same language, but they're all and pretty much the same culture, but if you were to find these 10 people and then separate them and, and, and ask them to write their opinion on something in separate rooms, uh, one controversial subject, whatever that might be, the meaning of life, well, when they finish, their conclusions would not agree with each other, not conclusively. They just would not. Well, consider this book that we're talking, this library of books we're talking about, uh, our Holy Bible, the Word of Truth. It does not merely consist of 10 authors. God used 40 different authors. God, they were tools, but God used 40 different authors to write the Bible. And it wasn't written in one generation. It was written over a period of 1,500 years. Over 1,500 years, 40 different instruments, 40 different authors God used. And none of the authors have the same education they didn't have the same culture they didn't have the same uh, language they had vastly different educations and they lived on three different continents and, th and they spoke at least three different languages and yet there is a unity in this library you will not find in any publication on planet earth how is that possible this is the word of truth that's how it's possible the word of there is complete harmony which cannot be explained by coincidence or collusion. Not over 1,500 years. It can't be. This is the word of God, the word of truth. Consume this. Abide in this. This is Jesus. Musicians, you can come back. Study and be eager to do your utmost to present yourself to God, approved, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing and handling the word of truth in the name of Jesus. Let it be so. Amen.